This is the lecture for ancient and medieval history for Thursday, the 18th of March, 2021. What do you do in the face of apocalypse? What do you do in the face of doomsday? How can you put Humpty Dumpty back together again? How can you take a society that has smashed itself into oblivion and do something with it that might actually be constructive? When the world has already started to come to an end, should you even try to stop it from falling? Or are you just prolonging the agony? Back in the day, sailors never wanted to learn how to swim. Never. Because, or almost never. Because um, if the ship went down, they'd die quickly. If they knew how to swim, they would inevitably struggle and struggle and struggle and prolong the agony for hours, maybe day or two, maybe more if they have something to cling to. This is what Romans faced and the Roman leaders faced in the late 200s AD, in the late 3rd century AD. After 50 years of civil war, what can you do in the face of Armageddon? In 284, 285, an emperor named Diocletian inherits, uh, takes, takes the throne when um, Numerian dies. And at first, he's just another emperor from the army. The later emperors from the army come from the Danubian provinces, what we now would call the Balkans, southeastern Europe. And they come from here because this border has been threatened. So a lot of the so more aggressive soldier types end up settling in this region. This is where Claudius fought the Goths, after all, at Nisus. How, if you're in Diocletian's position, do you put a broken world back together again, even with all the power of the Imperium, of the Roman Empire, how do you take a broken world and put it back together? And the answer to that question, or an answer to that question, is the last era of Roman imperial history. It is the dominate. So it is the longest era of the empire, stretching from 285 through 476, basically 200 years. The others were all about 100 years, give or take a decade or three. It is from the emperor's Diocletian through the last emperor in the West who has the ironic and tragic name Romulus Augustulus, named after the founder of Rome and the founder of the Roman Empire. It is roughly the 4th and 5th centuries AD. Now, the name Dominate comes from the new imperial title that is used of the emperors. Diocletian is the main innovator. And then a generation later, Constantine the Great takes what Diocletian began and pushes it even further in some directions. Diocletian realizes that one of the problems of the Roman Empire is that there is no reverence for the office anymore. So many emperors have come and gone, have been killed by other people that, you know, psh, you're a Roman emperor, big deal. It's like being an Irish king back in ancient times. If you brought the beer, men would call you king. I'm Irish, I know this, at least. I'm partially Irish, so I partially know this. So, Diocletian imports Persian court ritual. Persian court ritual treats the great king of Persia 
not as a god, but as if he were a god. The Persian great king is never seen on the level of other people. His throne room is designed in an interesting arch architectural fashion. This wall, first of all, the room would be long, not wide. Second of all, the wall behind the throne would be smaller than the wall behind the entrance. That way, just by the way the human eye works, the emperor or the great king, should I say, looks taller, bigger, more massive. Because human beings usually assign <clears throat> size by how they proportion against other things. So if you're up against the side of the room that has the big wall, you look relatively smaller, even though <clears throat> you're your height. <clears throat> and if you were standing up on the dais next to the throne with your back to the smaller wall, you'd look proportionally larger because the wall that you're set against is subtly smaller. Not obviously smaller, subtly smaller. Other court rituals are imported from Persia. Instead of having the emperor dress normally, the emperor in formal garb. When he's a soldier, he's a soldier. But when he's in court, he begins wearing more and more magnificent clothing. Sometimes cloth of gold. And the lighting is never direct. The ancients knew how to polish bronze mirrors to such a sheen that you could take sunlight from just outside that window and redirect it in here, and it would illuminate the room. So with a lot of tricks of light and darkness, you keep the room in darkness. Everyone is waiting for the emperor. And then there is a crash of cymbals and a blowing of horns and a beating of drums. And in that moment, skylights are opened, light beams in, blinding and dazzling you at the same moment as those cymbals and drums. And then walking into the room in magnificent uh, array and cloth of gold, shining like the sun, wearing a diadem that catches the light. That's a gemstone uh, crown. The emperor is there. And he moves like no man. He looks like no man. He looks divine. He looks like a, a magic man, a wizard. He looks like he has power, and not just political or military power. The emperor is seated on the throne. Before approaching the emperor, people must go to the floor in almost the same posture as a Chinese kowtow. In a kowtow, you go to your knees, then you go to your hands and knees, then you, place, you press your forehead against the floor. And you then stand up and do the same thing over and over again. Of course you're going to be searched. No one gets close to the emperor anymore with weapons. No one except his guards. So if you have a dagger on you, they will find it. <clears throat> and you'll have to account for it. The Roman emperor goes through all of this rigmarole and wears all of this frippery for a very good reason. Over time, people will get used to it, and they will associate these tricks of light and sound, of magic and stagecraft, with the Imperium to such a degree that the emperor will begin to seem like superhuman. Now, you might be willing to overthrow a person, but Captain America, Superman, much more difficult to imagine overthrowing somebody with superpowers. Diocletian is the first of the godlike emperors, and the title used is Dominus. Not Princeps, all of that pretense towards Republic is gone. 
all gone. And not in peditor, a military office, he who commands. No, 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 no. Dominus. Dominus is the name that a Latin-speaking person uses for their god. Dominus <clears throat> is the name that a Latin person, or the title that a Latin-speaking person uses if they are a slave to their master. The translation of Dominus is Lord. But the meaning is owner or God. <clears throat> so the emperors are taking on some Oriental, West Asian aspects. And Diocletian does this, even though he's a pretty straightforward soldier, because it's going to help the empire by making people think twice about raising their hands against the emperor, by bringing superstition into it, by creating an air, an aura of magnificence about himself, Diocletian is going to reduce the chances of people stabbing him in the back or raising rebellion against him. But that's not all. Diocletian correctly identifies what is wrong with the empire. And what has been wrong with the empire is the problem of imperial succession. So, Diocletian is going to solve this problem. And the way he solves this problem, if you are bothered by the fan, as ever, you may move. We've got spots over here. <clears throat> Diocletian establishes what is called the Tetrarchy. The Tetrarchy, well, here's a hint. Do any of you know what a tetrahedron is in terms of shapes? It's a, uh, it's a perfect shape, um, uh, according to the Greeks. Greeks. Tetrahedron is in the shape of a pyramid. It's a three, a base three-sided pyramid. It has four sides. So if I were to show you a Dungeons and Dragons dice that was a four-sided die, that is a tetrahedron. It has four sides. A tetrarchy is the rule of four emperors. Four? Well, yesterday I told you <clears throat> How many field armies the Romans were now able to uh, equip <clears throat> and staff? How many? Four. Four field armies. Four emperors. <coughs> One field army <clears throat> for the Rhine frontier. One field army, or maybe two. Actually, one field army for the Danube frontier. One field army between the Rhine, uh, the Danube frontier, and the east to act as reserve, or that field army may sometimes be in Greece or Italy, and one field army in the east. Four field armies. Four emperors. Let's see if I can actually utilize some of this. Uh, that's the Roman Empire. Oh, I can, assuming I can figure out how to do this. Good. So, what Diocletian, this is a little bit after his time, but you get the idea, is going to do is he's going to make three partners. Diocletian is going to be the ruler of the East, what is called Oriens or uh, Sunrise Land. And there's going to be a Western Emperor called Maxentius. And, no, no, Maximinus. Maximinus. And so at first, Diocletian invites his fellow general, Maximinus, to become Emperor. 
and take over the governing and the uh, protection of the Western Roman Empire along the Rhine and Upper Danube River. He is going to take over the Lower Danube River and the border with Persia, because this requires the biggest armies, and he's the senior emperor. So he divides the empire in two, east and west. This is actually not uncommon, especially in the later empire, but he's not done. There are still two other field armies. So Diocletian then invites two junior emperors. The senior emperors are going to be Diocletian and Maximinus. The junior emperors are going to be uh, Galerius and Constantine Chlorus, Constantine the Green. Constantine Chlorus is going to get the border in Britain, smaller army, subset of the army of Maximinus. Galerius is going to get a smaller army to guard the Danube. The rule of four. Why? The problem has been that when a pretender emperor from one field army takes power, the other armies object. And thus you have civil war. Diocletian is going to directly and brilliantly solve this, he thinks, by creating a permanent system. The two senior emperors are called Augusti, or Augustus. Each of them is called Augustus together. They are Augusti. They are the senior emperors, the Augustus, named after Augustus Caesar, the founder of the Roman Empire. The two junior emperors are going to be called Caesar after the uncle of Augustus, Julius Caesar, who inspired it. So, we have senior emperor Diocletian and senior emperor Maximinus. We have junior emperor uh, Constantine Chlorus and junior emperor Galerius. Augustus Diocletian, Augustus Maximinus, Caesar Constantine Chlorus, Caesar Galerius. He's going to go further. In addition to establishing this system of four emperors, each watching each other's back, each working consciously together, 20 years after becoming emperor, Diocletian is going to retire. Nobody retires from the Imperium. <clears throat> Nobody retires who is emperor except Diocletian. What Diocletian is trying to do is set up term limits. He's going to rule as Augustus for 20 years. He forces Maximinus to resign also. Maximinus does not want to resign. But Diocletian's his patron, he's senior emperor. So Diocletian and Maximinus simultaneously resign their offices and retire. Constantine Chlorus is now bumped up to uh, Augustus, or his son is actually, and Galerius is now bumped up to Augustus. And what they're supposed to do is take on two junior emperors themselves. What Diocletian sets up is a self-perpetuating oligarchy with four emperors working together for the good of the empire. Two senior emperors, two junior emperors, 20-year terms. This is so logical. And in it, is the potential to end these civil wars. And it's based on the rule of four because there are four field armies. It makes sense. If we were logical beings, it would have worked. We'll come back to the fate of the Tetrarchy later. But that's not all. Diocletian appreciates that barter has returned to much of the Roman world, that money is practically useless. So he establishes rules about money that have all these lousy, diluted coins turned into the government for recasting. They'll get re you'll get remunerated for them with real new money. At first, Diocletian cannot make pure coins. There just isn't enough silver or gold for it. 
So his coinage is much, much, much less diluted than it had been, like 20% base metals. Eventually, what he's going for, though, is pure coins again. Pure coins, just like they had before the crisis. So people have to turn in their coins. And if you're caught trying to pass false coins off, you're going to get tortured to death. And anyone working with you is going to get tortured to death. And their families and pets are going to get tortured to death. This, the, the punishments ramped up under Diocletian. But that's not all. In order to deal with hyperinflation, Diocletian decides to, again, unsubtly and directly, but very logically, use his power by setting up a set of wage and price controls throughout the empire. What a wage and price control law is, it's a law that sets the price of every object that can be bought. A necktie, though the Romans didn't have them. A magnetic identity holder, because, but the Romans didn't have them. Eyeglasses, but the Romans didn't have them. Belt buckles, yeah, the Romans had some of those. Shoes, yeah, the Romans had some of those. A bowl of oatmeal. Yeah, the Romans, they had that. So the price of everything is now going to be set by the government in order to stop the hyperinflation and return money to the economy where it had stopped being used. But that's not the entire picture of the market. It's not just the price of things. It's also how much you get paid. So the same law is going to establish wages for every type of worker within the empire. If you get paid less, the emperor is going to hear about it and you're going to get your money. And whoever tried cheating you is going to get punished. If, on the other hand, you insist on getting paid more than what Diocletian wants you to earn, you're a criminal and torture and extortion of information, or extraction of information, and death, and the death of loved ones. You know who does wage and price controls today? Communists. What Diocletian sets up is an economy regulated by the government. It is a form of state socialism or communism, in the sense that the Roman imperial government insists on controlling what money is, because of hyperinflation and because of the return of barter and on controlling how much people can spend and how much people can earn. Again, this is what communists do. The government decides how much your labor is worth. You don't negotiate with your boss. The government decides. Now, there are still people today who think, well, yeah, we should do that. If we had a $15 an hour minimum wage, everything would be better. Not taking into account that the economy of places like Chicago, New York City, even Seattle or uh, Spokane is more heated up than economies in Nebraska, Kansas, Maine, um, or um, in New Mexico. $15 an hour in Kansas, that's a good wage. $15 an hour in any of our big cities is, is starvation wages. Having a national minimum wage, which, by the way, is mentioned nowhere in the federal constitution of the United States as a power that the government has, <clears throat> having a federal minimum wage, even if it were constitutional, does not take into account the economic realities on the ground throughout our huge country. But some people believe that if the government gets involved, it's got to be good. Well, Diocletian is facing a collapsed economy. Not collapsing anymore. It's gone. Collapsed. And he's trying to rebuild it from the ground up. And he, what he has to work with is the coercive power of the state. He has his imperial power. So that's what he's going to do. He's going to use that imperial power. He's going to make laws. He's going to enforce those laws. 
He's going to punish lawbreakers. He's going to make examples of people. You know, that's been done here. In the early 1970s, one of the reasons, uh, one of the results, and maybe one of the reasons why President Nixon took us off the gold standard at one time before that, uh, every dollar was backed up by a piece of gold in a Federal Reserve Bank somewhere. Not anymore. But one of the reasons President Nixon took us off the gold standard, and one of the effects of taking us off the gold standard, is suddenly the value of each American dollar plummets. Everything becomes more expensive, and trust me, prices get ahead of wages. So suddenly the buying power of American families goes into the basement. This is a problem. So President Nixon, a Republican, and at that time considered to be a conservative, establishes socialist-style wage and price controls in the United States in the early and mid-1970s. President Ford does the same thing. So the President of the United States and the Congress of the United States decides how much a lamb chop costs in the supermarket across the country, decides how much a truck driver should earn across the country, decides how much teachers and policemen, college professors, and... Um, City mayors decides what people can earn and decides what prices should be. Did that solve the problem? You think it might? It's so logical. But we're not logical creatures beyond a very limited point. Do you know what wage and price controls always do? They establish a black market. A black market is what you call an illegal market in goods. When the United States establishes the prohibition law in the, at the end of World War I, do Americans just say, oh, I guess I'm not going to drink booze anymore? <clears throat> no. We establish a black market in booze. By the way, before we had that black market and booze, organized crime was not a problem in this country. After we did that, organized crime became powerful enough to affect state and national politics, and it is still a curse with us to this day. Outlawing booze didn't work. Why? Because we are not the most lawful of societies. And because human beings are not necessarily going to say, oh, there's a law against doing what I love doing, I'm just going to stop. No, people don't always work like that. There are limits to how much you can legislate morality. So a black market and booze develops. The oldest profession, as it's called, is prostitution. Most societies consider it to be immoral, and most societies in the West have outlawed it. Does that mean that it just doesn't exist in those places? Hell no. It means that the people engaged in it are, are criminals, and the people who run it are criminals. I'm not saying it's a good thing, uh, but in states like, Las, uh, like Nevada, it is legal. person can become legally a prostitute, and their health care is monitored by the state, and, and their working conditions are monitored by the state. Now, I'm not sure that's the answer, but what I can tell you is where there are laws against prostitution, there's always a black market in it. Yeah? What, what's the point of prostitution? Uh, if you think about it from a societal standpoint, what you're trying to do is preserve family values and morals. Think about it this way. If you had a little sister that you loved, that was innocent and nice, and suddenly she decided that that's what she wanted to do with her life, it might bother you in a way that... Maybe that's just what Well, exactly, and that's what a libertarian would say. Libertarian would say personal freedom should trump all of these laws. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people have libertarian tendencies. I Again, I, I as a conservative would not like to see legal prostitution in Coeur d'Alene. On the other hand, I appreciate that there is prostitution in Coeur d'Alene because there's prostitution everywhere human beings exist. And there has been since the beginning. This is my problem with gun laws. On top of everything else, they never work. 
the Chicago neighborhoods that have the highest murder rates in the country, and my old neighborhood in the Bronx, New York City, have some of the most stringent gun laws in the world, not just in the country. Criminals have guns. A lot of criminals have guns. A lot of criminals have a lot of guns. The gun laws don't stop the criminals from having guns because they're criminals. Who do the gun laws stop from having guns? Law-abiding citizens. So when a criminal mugs you on the street, give me your money or I'll shoot you, they're pretty sure that their victims are not going to pull out a gun of their own and start blasting, which is what would happen here because so many people in North Idaho are armed and because our state respects the Second Amendment. Laws don't necessarily change what they're intended to change. It is not a logical scientific experiment that you can go tweak and suddenly society becomes better. It's not the way it works. If it was, we wouldn't have a drug problem because drugs are largely illegal unless you're in Oregon. But we do. We have a serious drug problem. And methamphetamines have done more to damage the American people in the countryside than anything since the Dust Bowl, which destroyed the entire agricultural output of the state of Oklahoma back in the 1930s. If laws really worked, we'd have no drug problem, we'd have no gun problem, we'd have no prostitution. Um, and we'd have no booze, but they don't. The problem with wage and price controls, here's how some butchers got around it. So you go to the butcher shop or you go to the meat section of your supermarket and you want to get a nice, I don't know, T-bone steak or ribeye or something. But the government has regulated how much per ounce of beef you can charge for a ribeye or for a T-bone, which are both good steaks. So um, what the butcher did is he would cut the meat slightly differently, leaving an extra lobe of meat on that wouldn't normally be there. And now it's not a T-bone or a ribeye. It's something else. It's a new cut of meat. And because the government hasn't caught up yet to the new cut of meat, uh, the butcher can charge you market prices for it, and you can get a hold of it. Sometimes this was done openly, usually not. Sometimes this was done on the sly. Through backdoor channels, illegally through the black market. The Soviets did a great job of controlling their economy according to their laws. Everything was under wage and price controls in communist Russia. Communist Russia had the world's largest black market for 50 years as a result because the laws that control these sorts of things never work. Diocletian is trying to get a grip on everything that's wrong with Rome. And he only has the coercive power of the state to work with. So he makes laws. Do his wage and price controls work perfectly? No, they don't. Do they work a little bit? Yes, they do. They help arrest this and stop the hyperinflation that was bringing back barter. As much as a conservative as I am, I cannot deny that Diocletian's system works. It changes the trajectory of Rome from a society that's falling apart into a society that may not be as easy as it once was to live in, but it's a society where money begins to have value again. And when money begins to have value again, the friction between buyer and seller has a lubricant between them that's going to allow trade to function. Eyes on me from time to time. Makes me feel important. So, um, Diocletian has set up the godlike imperial court. He has set up the Tetrarchy with three other godlike imperial courts. He has set up wage co price controls. You'd think that would be all. Nah! No! Diocletian formalizes the four field army structure, and he establishes two classes of Roman legionaries. The old men and boys are going to be what are called garrison armies, and these garrison armies are going to be in places I would still, at my age, probably be liable to, for service in a garrison army. 
And what that would mean is that part of my life would be spent as a guardsman, watching streets after dark. And if our castle or our community, our town was attacked, uh, I, would, I would be able to stand on a wall, presumably, and help pour boiling oil down on the enemy. I'd be able to stand on a wall and maybe shoot a bow or maybe help throw some rocks down or whatever. So would you. You all are younger than military age. Now, have there been people your age that have fought in battles? Yeah, lots of them. Have they fought well? Yeah, lots of them. But ideally, it's better to wait a few more years so that you're more fully physically mature. Uh, ideally, having people younger than me do the fighting is also the best way to go because people my age don't have the wind that we used to have. We don't have the endurance we used to have. That's a factor of age. If you live long enough, it'll happen to you. So these garrison armies are set up everywhere. In every town, in every farm that's been fortified, in every community that still has people behind walls, a proportion of the men in that community are in the garrison army. So that if anything attacks, the garrison army can defend it. Now this is called defense in depth. So what are the field armies used for? Well, let's look at defense in depth in your notes. So flip ahead to the diagrams of imperial defense that we were talking about, and you'll see the bottom diagram on that page. And the bottom diagram on that page shows defense in depth. The basic concept of defense in depth is you take everything valuable and you put it behind walls. Everything that's valuable is put behind walls. So, keep going. It's after your maps. These diagrams here. So, we're looking at the same river frontier that we had in the first two. This time, though, you'll see on the bottom left map, that the indefensible lowland cities have been aban abandoned. Hilltops towns have been reoccupied. Uh, there are fortified granaries where you put your grain. Fortified farmsteads. They also have set up toll booths, if you want to call them that, along Rome's roads at choke points like bridges and canyons. Everything that's valuable is put behind walls so that as the enemy attacks, and those are the white lines on this lower thing, they have to choose, do I get stuck here like flypaper at this castle, at this fortified granary, at this fortified farmhouse, at this town? Do I just decide that the whole raid is about this one place, in which case I'm going to dig in and try to get over the walls? Or am I going to go deeper into the empire where there may be richer pickings, and I have to then weave my way through this network of fortifications? And if you see the, uh, the main uh, white arrow force moving south along that central road, it's going, having to go around all of these different walled fortifications, and this is going to slow them down. Now, if an entire barbarian army wants to take my fortification, unless I'm really good and they're really incompetent, they probably will. But it'll take them time. And this is all about buying time. Defense in depth is about buying time. What you do is by putting everything behind walls and by making young men and old men, your garrison soldiers, who don't have to march around killing people, just have to hang out behind walls and throw things down them, is you slow down all of the attacks. Theoretically, the enemy does not get nearly as deep into your territory before they get bounced back out by one of the four field armies or by units of one of the four field armies. More to the point, what if you move past 
this fortified granary. And you think, ah, we'll just leave it. You move past it. We have troops in here. And when you go past us that night, we're going to sneak up behind the barbarians and kill them! And, or, or kill a few of them and then run back to the fortified granary. If the enemy is not in the midst of a wide-open civilian country ready for the, the, the plunder, if instead you are inside a network of small, medium, and large fortifications, you have to wonder where your next attack is coming from. You have to wonder if going deep into the Roman Empire is really the way to go. So defense in depth is going to make the imperial borders stronger again. It is a better system than elastic defense. And Diocletian sets this up so that the enemy, no matter how far it goes in, is going to encounter walls that are going to slow them down. Hell, thanks to Aurelian, even the city of Rome has walls now. The highways are still open if you're a Roman army or a Roman civilian. But if you're a barbarian raiding party, you are in much tougher shape. So there are far more troops than Rome used to have during the crisis. The field armies are really good troops. They're as good as Rome ever fielded. But there are only four of them. The rest of the troops are garrison troops. People like you and me who would be okay behind walls. All of this, all of this, all of this costs money. All of this costs coin. Silver and gold are spent on steel so that Romans can survive. So, for some reason I felt the need to sing a dog roll. It happens. If you are listening. Diocletian addresses the problem of imperial succession through the godlike court and through establishing the tetrarchy. He solves the problem of the loss of the value of money with his wage and price controls. And he solves the problem of the uh, elastic defense and the elastic borders of the empire by having Stat, uh, defense in depth. Chuck the fan, close the shades, turn the lights off. Please. We're going to talk next time about what else he does, but I want to show you a few examples of this. This, These are the same statues uh, taken from different angles. And these are the statues of the Tetrarchs. You've got a senior emperor and a junior emperor, a senior emperor and a junior emperor, and they are clutching one another. One arm is around the front or back of the other guy's shoulders, and one arm is on the swords. These emperors are looking nervously into the darkness, looking for threats, counting upon one another for support. This is of the first, this is of the two senior emperors. Can you see how Roman sculpture has changed? This is a gargoyle-like aesthetic. The men, Diocletian and uh, Maximinus, are clutching one another by the shoulders. All they've got is each other. What do those orbs represent, bless you? What do those orbs represent? Well, they've got the whole world in there. Yeah, it's the world. So these Roman gargoyles, the emperors, the senior emperors, bless you, carry the weight of the world. And the only way they can carry it is with each other's help. That's the Tetrarchy. These four guys are looking into uh, the distance, looking for threats that they're going to need to fight. And that's where we'll leave it today. You can open up the shades again, turn on the lights. Next week, Wednesday or Thursday, there is going to be an exam on the Roman Empire stuff. I suspect we'll finish instruction on it.
Monday or Tuesday, and in which case, if we do, it'll be Wednesday. Uh, if not, it'll be Thursday. So be ready for that. Also, you have another unit uh, survey due, another chapter survey. So be ready. See you tomorrow on video.